You're listening to the Speaking Tongues podcast. I'm your host, El Sharice. Each week, I sit down to a conversation with multilinguals where we discuss and celebrate language, life, and culture through our own perspectives. Episode 38, Speaking Yoruba. Hello, language lovers. Happy New Year. Happy 2021. And thank you for joining me for this episode of Speaking Tongues, the podcast in conversation with multilinguals. On this first episode of the new year, I'm speaking with Anike, a writer and storyteller from London, about her heritage language of Yoruba. In this conversation, we're not just talking about Yoruba language, friends. Oh, no, 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 no. We're talking about Nigerian heritage and the culture of British-born Nigerians and how their culture is expressed in the UK. We discuss the connection between storytelling and language, the links between Yoruba language and culture throughout parts of the Caribbean, and how proverbs in the Yoruba language relate to the Yoruba culture and lifestyle. And one more thing. Anike is also the author of Connecting to Self Through Ancestry, a collection of essays exploring themes in relation to womanhood, identity, mental health, and spirituality, whilst deconstructing 10 elements of Yoruba heritage and highlighting how they relate to the past experiences of a young woman growing up in the diaspora. You can hear her talk about her book in this episode and find a link to her site in the show notes. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I think the beauty of doing this show is that we can hear many perspectives on language and culture from so many different people. For example, we've spoken about Yoruba last year, we've spoken about London last year, but in this episode, we're speaking about Yoruba and London in a totally different way. So if you enjoyed those conversations, you will enjoy this one 100%. Thank you, Anike, for sharing bits of your language and your heritage with us in this episode. As always, if you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe on Instagram and rate and review the Speaking Tongues podcast on Apple Podcasts so that other language lovers like ourselves can find the show. Okay, let's chat. Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Tongues. I am here today with my guest, Anike, from... She's joining me all the way today from the UK. Hi, Anike. How are you? Hello. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm so happy that we're going to have this conversation today. And for this episode, we are talking about Yoruba and several other languages. So I like to start each episode with the same question, which is, what is your first language and how many languages do you speak? Oh, so my first language, it's funny because I grew up, I, I was born in the UK in London. So English obviously was a, was the first language, but I grew up in a household where my mum spoke to me in Yoruba. So I would say that both English and Yoruba were the sort of first, my first entry points into language. Um, and other languages that I do speak, I mean, I speak English in terms of fluently, it's English and then Yoruba is, is, I have a good understanding and conversational and also Spanish. Um, I speak that too. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> so growing up and hearing Yoruba spoken at home um, and you live in an English speaking country, mm-hmm. what was, what was that dynamic like? That was really interesting. I, as a child, I really struggled to embrace that um, that sort of duality because I grew up in a space where like I felt that my heritage or my culture that I was exposed to in in my home was was almost like a burden for me to sort of embrace embrace my Britishness Mm. and I remember you know growing up really anytime that my mom spoke to me in Yoruba like outside of the house I'd be like mom you know don't speak like that you know really trying to sort of hide my my heritage felt like this thing that I had to hide and only sort of embrace um secretly Mm. and so I really struggled to embrace um my Yoruba language and I think that's what impacted me in terms of now that my ability to speak Yoruba isn't isn't as 
as strong as my English because I was really um, resistant to, to speaking the, the language. So anytime my mum would speak to me in Yoruba, I'd answer back in English. And that was a kind of normal dynamic for a lot of people, actually. Um, a lot of friends of mine, they had that kind of dynamic as well, where they'd, you know, they'd be spoken to in their mother tongue of their heritage, but respond in, in, in English. Mm-hmm. That seems like I picked up on what you said about the word that you said, Britishness. Mm. Um, and I feel like it's so interesting to me. Like personally, I'm always so interested in Black British people because I've always been interested in how our, like me as an African-American, like how are our, how we're perceived against Americanness and how you're perceived against Britishness and just like what that dynamic is like and what it does to us and how it it affects us and how it makes us feel. I guess I'm I'm bringing all this up because I want to know like do you feel like attitudes about Britishness are changing at all or have you felt it changing at all in in you know not in not necessarily in your personal experience but just in general like is it changing? I would say that there is change in terms of so when I was growing up there, when I sort of watched TV and things like that, there wasn't this display of, um, of this kind of multi-ethnic Britain. And I would say that now in terms of TV shows and, and you know, I don't know if it's through social, social media, but there's just more conversations about Britishness and, and race. And obviously there's a lot of work out there. Um, you know, from Renier de Lodge's Why I'm No Longer Speaking to White People About Race. There's just, there's more out there um, now in comparison to growing up as a, you know, as a, a teenager, as a child. There didn't seem to be these access, or for me, uh, noticeable. Maybe they were there, but I just wasn't aware of them at the time. So I would definitely say that there's more conversations. And then obviously with with you know the events in June um, that ha- that occurred in with George, with George Floyd that occurred in the U.S. that trickled to to Britain and there was there's just been more discussion about race and and Britishness mm-hmm. um, in in yeah in in recent years. It's great that that conversation is starting. I think, and I I think it's important for people outside of Britain also because I think what's exported to other countries is this very like you know the monarchy and this very Mm -hmm. like upper crust understanding of what British culture is and then you can go to a really big city like London and it's it's like everything but that you know (laughs) it's like people from all corners of the world and and you you see it on the streets so I think it's really great that there's like conversation happening. Um, I want to ask what your language learning experience like was when you were in school? What type of languages or which languages were you, uh, were compulsory to take to, to learn or what were people typically interested in learning as a second language? Mm, So yeah, in school, it was either French or Spanish. And so my first introduction to yeah languages, I think I was, let's say, yeah, 12, 13. Um, and yeah, we were, had the option. We were first learning like both French and Spanish. So we had those lessons. And then uh, when you got older into the sort of uh, the higher parts of secondary school, so like around 15, you then had to choose uh, between French or Spanish, and I just stuck with Spanish. And that, uh, I carried that to university. So part of my degree, I wanted to sort of learn Spanish. And I had the option as well to, to live in Spain for a year. So I lived in Valencia. Cool. And, but yeah, it was a re- really beautiful time. Um, so yeah, I lived in Valencia as an English teacher at a school. and 
that helped me to because I would I have to be honest at school like secondary school and Spanish I was sort of learning Spanish but I didn't really like I think it was when I lived in Spain that I was ha- like I was forced to yeah to sort of communicate more and really get familiar with the language outside of a textbook or you know those audio cassette players <laughs> <laughs> of learning languages yeah uh, how was it in in Valencia being abroad and and being and I guess going through that process of being on the ground and like okay my textbook didn't teach me this I have to figure it out on my own type of way of moving around. Yeah, it was it was so interesting because when I first moved, I I think Google Translate was my best friend <laughs> because <laughs> I basically um it was moving and having to navigate you know opening a bank account and getting a national security number and going to look at apartments so yeah google translator was my best friend when i was sending all those emails like to landlords asking to view apartments but then it could only help you so much and the thing i really enjoyed uh yeah about my time in valencia was that a lot of the people were very patient with you so they could see that you were trying to sort of say something or communicate and they would continue speaking to you in the language. I've lived in other places, um, you know, like in, in Belgium and with French where as soon as they spot, there's like a sort of mistake or you haven't sort of said something correctly, they'll switch to English. Mm. Whereas in Spain, it was more so like, okay, just keep speaking to you. So that helped me in terms of understanding the language a lot. Um, but yeah, and that helps me as well because now I've lived in, in Portugal uh, most recently and the, the, the similarities in Portuguese and Spanish helped me to sort of pivot when I was yeah, living in Lisbon. I think it's great that you note that they were willing to carry on the conversation in Spanish. And that's happened to me definitely in French speaking countries where you say one, like you said, you said one wrong word. <laughs> And then they just give up or you have people who like I've encountered people who don't even want to try speaking their native language because they want to try speaking English. They want to practice their English with you. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic, I think. (laughs) Yeah, it really is. (laughs) I was saying to a friend that, yeah, like, that's why um, learning French felt like this. It felt like such a chore because I was like, I, if I make a mistake, someone's going to point it out and then it's just going to feel, it felt really um, discouraging at times. Mm. And so, yeah, I, I feel like I had more fun, more fun learning Spanish. Um, I, I'm, I'm not fluent now, I'm conversational, but yeah, it's, it's, I really like that welcoming approach to, yeah, to learning a language. Mm -hmm. it's really daunting when the language you're trying to learn it feels like you're trying to get into a club (laughs) like like a members only club and you just you don't have the password right you know and they're not willing to kind of grant you any favors so it's I think it's like you said it's nice when when there's a warm reception to you know to to wanting to learn that language yeah I definitely, um, we used to have these things called intercambio, uh, which was basically you meet someone and if they wanted to sort of practice their English, they would communicate to you in English, but you would communicate back to them in Spanish. So those were kind of mechanisms that were used. If someone did want to learn English, then at least it'd be kind of balanced. Um, yeah, both structure. Get something out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Mm. Um, so we talked a bit about this just, a few minutes ago, but um, I would love to know about uh, your cultural representation in London. How do people in the Yoruba speaking diaspora connect with one another? And how do you see their representation in a city like London? There's so many cultural reference points. And that's why I'm really grateful for (laughs) London has a lot of its challenges, but just as a hub of culture, it's it's been amazing for me because it's 
through food, music, you know, the hair salons, like <laughs> gatherings, church, <laughs> all these different aspects of everyday life that enabled me to connect with my culture and really um, see, identify myself as a British-born Nigerian because it meant that even though I was born in the diaspora, I had all of these reference points. So when I did eventually go to my, for the first time to Nigeria as a, as a child, I was familiar with some, you know, the food or language. It, it didn't feel so, um, it didn't feel so f- like, I, I don't want to say the word foreign, but so out of the distance didn't fit, seem so far um, because of all of these important reference points that I had uh, growing up in London. and. It's also fascinating to me now in terms of some of the traveling that I've uh, done as an adult, because I've been able to see Yoruba reflected in in different spaces that I wasn't even expecting to to see Yoruba. So Hmm. a couple of years ago, I went to Jamaica um, for three weeks and that was just a trip that I decided I'd left a job and I was like you know what it's winter it's dark it's cold <laughs> I want to go <laughs> to the sun and I literally went there not really sort of with this mindset that I'm going to sort of learn about history or ancestry but I found out that there was a place uh, named in Jamaica after the the town that my mum is from in Nigeria And so there are these cultural reference points that exist that also enable uh, me to connect to my heritage and see culture represented in different parts of the diaspora. And I think that's a really beautiful thing of of showing how fluid and mobile culture is, even though it's never restricted to this one place. I think that's amazing. How cool is that? Mm. It was so cool. Yeah. Yeah. And like you, I think I'm always, oh, I know I'm always interested in these connections and, and how there's so much from, like, I like to, I don't like to say, but I know (laughs) that um, from the West coast of Africa, there's so many influences that ended up in, the Americas and things that I think we didn't even know about until recently. I think we're lucky that we do have the ability now to find these touchstones and find these connections, um, especially through language as well. And, mm-hmm. you know, through cultural practices and, and music and <laughs> food and nor- and all of our cultural norms. But I think that it's really wonderful that you could directly trace something from Nigeria to Jamaica because I think that's not as common yeah honestly I I have now I think it's because of the work that I'm doing with Oro Anike but I literally feel that my antenna is always out and then some randomly in a conversation with someone I just I'm so curious about those breadcrumbs of information that are dotted around that really show this beautiful map of how connected um, Africa and the Caribbean are. And uh, yeah, I'm really, really fascinated about um, the different pockets of of culture which tell deeper stories of of people and ideas, exchange and creativity. It's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's what I love about your your site because I think that we haven't, I think, as Black people all over the world, we, ha- we haven't been the ones to tell our stories. Mm. And we haven't been the ones to showcase for ourselves, with ourselves, with our own people, um, our creativity. And, and I don't think that we've really allowed these connections so openly in the way that we are now. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, that's what drew me to to your site and to your essays and your conversations that you have, because you're doing that. Like I can I can learn about people who are doing amazing things and people who 
look like me. <laughs> and I and I think it's it's something that's so necessary. Um, yeah, that's what led to it. I really felt called to create a space where I could place myself in history rather than learn about history from this kind of, uh, from like with, with a lot of space in between. Because you know, sometimes when you're learning about something, it's either like you go to the museum or you go to a textbook and it just feels really out of touch. And culture is so intimate, you know, with food, with music. These are parts of our reality. And why not create an opportunity to go deeper into what these things, the language of memory that these things are evoking? British-born Nigerian culture. Mm-hmm. It sounds like the coolest thing in the world <laughs> to me. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Funny you should say that. <laughs> really? Why? Just because um, growing up, um, it was really cool to be associated to the Caribbean. And b- being associated from Africa, it was like this thing you carried with shame. Like at, at schools, you wanted to be like, say like, oh, I'm from Jamaica. Like it, it felt, it was cooler. And so like now it seems as if there's this kind of embrace um, which is which is, is welcomed, but yeah, at the time, it, yeah, it didn't feel like a cool thing. That's Maybe so funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny because it was the same thing here when I was growing up. Mm. Like it was so cool to just. I I mean, I remember going to school with girls who just lied and said, "Oh yeah, my family's from Jamaica," and it's like, "No, mm. your family's from South Carolina." Like. <laughs> I remember, I've grown up with you. I know where your family's from. <laughs> I think it's really cool. And I think, I think it's really interesting and really cool for me just as an outsider and observing, like, I'm seeing all these, like, Nigerian, um, British-born Nigerian or, you know, I, I don't know. Do people say, like, British Nigerian or Nigerian British or... Maybe yeah, to be honest, it's, it's, there's no kind of correct acronym. Um, some people will just say they are British Nigerian, Nigerian British, British born. Yeah. I asked this question, I guess, you know, what the culture is like, just thinking about how, how similar New York and London are. And, um, you know, here we have big representations of certain groups of people. and you know, some of the culture can be at times, I mean, I've lived here my whole life, but, um, you know, certain cultures seem to be like the popular ones that everyone's really, uh, trying to be a part of or paying attention to or celebrating at the time. And I was wondering if, you know, Nigerian culture is kind of having this, their moment in the sun. (laughs) I definitely, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to see, like, I was just listening to WizKid's new album uh, yesterday, and like, yeah, all the features on there, and like, just even in, in terms of like London, you're, when you go to sort of food markets, you've got like Nigerian tapas, and like all these kinds of things that, Ooh. yeah, I did not see this um, Uh, growing up like growing up the restaurants we used to have were like these very kind of like I don't know like sort of like home cooked uh, food but like sort of makeshift restaurants and now like you've got yeah like you've got these um really innovative ways in which culture is represented in in fashion in hairstyles in yeah in in just yeah language it's 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 beautiful really is Mm -hmm. I think that's just awesome. (laughs) I think that's really so cool. So we talked a little bit about uh, storytelling and um, what, you know, how you came to uh, starting your site and and telling these stories. Um, How do you view the links between storytelling, language, and culture? Ah, that's... Interesting storytelling, language, and culture. Like I, I just see that storytelling is what shapes language, culture, all these things. I think that 
I used to view storytelling in such a rigid, rigid way. I just used to think, okay, books. When I thought storytelling, I thought, okay, books. But now I see that storytelling is, is all around. Like I'm telling a story just in terms of visually my features, my accent, my name. Um, and it's, it's, in, it's all around in nature. Storytelling is, is a very natural phenomena, I think. And it's been a very beautiful process to realize that and see that language is another way in which that I, I can pinpoint certain stories I, and then I can pinpoint certain views and certain ways of seeing and understanding the world. So I think it's, a, it's, um, it's, it's like water almost. I, I was talk, talking to a friend about this, that storytelling is water because it's, it's not restricted to a space, the place. It, it move, as people move, the stories then expand and we're sort of gifted with an opportunity to view the story from, from different uh, vantage points. I like that you said that you're telling a story from your name, from the way mm. that you look. So in Yoruba language specifically, as it relates to the culture, do you feel that, or do you believe that the language and the culture are tied together? Or do you feel like they could be separate, separated is a better word. Mm, I see them as two sides of the same coin because especially for me in, in dig it, do, going a bit deeper in terms of learning about um, my heritage, I've, language has enabled me to really appreciate, um, yeah, ways of seeing and understanding the world. And I am a lover of proverbs and Proverbs I see as, I think there's a TED talk where a woman's talking about proverbs as life hacks for people. And literally uh, proverbs help me to better understand, yeah, life and uh, better understand the kind of values that I regard. And that is, yeah, that shows the beauty and power of language because language is offering you an insight to, uh, to something deeper and and I think it's really, really important to create space to, yeah, go deeper into, as I'm learning a language, I'm also wanting to learn more about myself in the process. And learning Yoruba has, is enabling me to do that because, yeah, I'm currently taking lessons to sort of improve my, my Yoruba. And yeah, I'm coming across such beautiful uh, ways of communicating. And it's, it's, it's really... For me, it, it affirms me, it grounds me that I come from a space that's very rich in appreciating um, life and appreciating creativity and uh, appreciating expression. Do you have a favorite proverb? Oh, I have, yeah, I ha I'll share two proverbs. Um, so the first one is Iwa Lewa which basically means um, character is beauty. And that is pointing to the importance of the inner that is regarded in, in like Yoruba philosophy, that in, it's important for you to nurture your character and, and to live a life of value so that can be expressed in the external. So through the things that you do through the relationships that you have, have high regard for your inner as well as your outer. Mm. So that's one. Um, another proverb that I've been really reflecting on lately um, is any tioni any kon usi, ni usi. And that basically means anybody who doesn't have anybody around they also, that person isn't around. So it's that idea of everybody needs everybody. And I think it's such a beautiful way of showing how we, it's important to coexist with each other. That like you are, I am because you are. And that's a really important life lesson um, that I take for me in, in just remembering that, yeah, I'm part of something bigger. And I think that's, 
those are two examples in showing how language offers an opportunity for me to learn so much more than just expert speaking the language. It's, it's pointing to something deeper and that that is related to ways of seeing and understanding yourself and your surroundings. Right. And I, I thank you so much for sharing both of those. Um, I feel like a different person just hearing them because you know, there's so important things that we, we all need to take with us, I think. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. I like, and I agree with you. I feel like, I hope that people understand that when they do set out to learn another language, it's, it's not just to understand how to uh, decline a word or, or, or to get the right tense of a noun. It, it's really just a journey with yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's a journey to understanding yourself. And what I take away from what you've, from the Proverbs that you told, you're learning a new version of yourself and you are existing side by side with, you know, the, the version of yourself that you've always known. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense, but <laughs> yeah, no, I completely get that. You get that. Yeah. And, and I often like to ask the question about, you know, I often like to ask people if they feel different when they speak another language and people usually give me, you know, the, that the answer that they do. And I think that um, it's more than just, you know, maybe you speak, Russian and you're more direct and you speak, I don't know, Portuguese and you're more playful. But I I think that the way that you're saying it, it's really tapping into um, a a different way of being and a different way of moving through life. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, completely, completely. Um, When I started to embrace my curiosity to sort of um, develop an understanding, a better understanding of Yoruba, I am developing a better understanding of myself and I didn't even realize it at the time. So yeah, when I started the project, it was more like talking about culture, but I feel like the more I'm doing this work, the more I'm broadening my perspective and it's, it's yeah, it's many layers of, of stretching myself. And I think that's always a beautiful thing to stretch yourself and be a bit more open and curious to different ways of seeing and understanding the world. Mm -hmm. I really like the second proverb that you told about, um, and the message about uh, being together. And, Mm. and I think that for me, um, that's very tied to, it seems to be very tied to Yoruba culture and the way that people are able to maybe um, have communities and celebrate with one another and, and maybe the bigger message of, of family mm. and fellowship, um, you know, things like that are really important because it, you know, for someone who maybe doesn't know any Yoruba and wants to learn from zero, um, doesn't know anything about about the culture, about the people, um, mm. proverbs like that will really be an indicator for them to understand how the culture works, that this is a culture of people who look out for each other and feel like they need one another in, in this life. Yeah, I think that that's the beauty of language as well in showing it's, uh, it's this access point to a sense of home, a sense of familiarity. And I think that's so, when I'm doing the work in exploring aspects of Caribbean heritage, I'm seeing, yeah, words that I am familiar with. So, yeah, the example that I gave when I went to Jamaica and I came across this place called Abel Kuta, it's it's so interesting to me that that is, is a reference point for some people for home and community and the people surrounding that area, they are... Uh, direct descendants of the Yoruba indentured workers that came, um, you know, back in the in the start of the early, I think it was 20th century, um, not mistaken. And that is beautiful that 
they, um, they call themselves Nago. And Nago is a word that is used in Yoruba to, you know, like um, someone to desc- who can describe themselves as an Anglophile. And Nago has, is that word in, in Yoruba and uh, for, to describe someone who is of Yoruba descent. So that, that, from that word Nago, which I've come across in Jamaica, Haiti, just uh, uh, dotted across the Caribbean is linking to a, a space and to, linking to a sort of wider community, wider sense of family, um, just through that one word. And that's the power of language. Wow, that's incredible. I have to do some research on this and I would love to look into it more and include some links in the show notes or on my blog so that, um, you know, people can look into this also for themselves and maybe find connections that they have uh, a personal relation to. In a previous episode, we learned about the importance of greetings in Yoruba and my guest said that learning to properly greet someone is perhaps the most important thing one should understand when first learning Yoruba. What do you think are any cultural things that a person should understand when they're trying to learn Yoruba? Do you think that greetings are important? Are there other things that someone should know when they do decide to learn the language? Mm, yeah, like I was listening to that episode and I agree, the importance of greeting. Um, so, so powerful. I think um, as well, it's, it's important, as I mentioned before, that um, it's important to realise that learning the language is, is offering an opportunity to learn other things as well. And I'm going to sort of uh, reference philosophy here that like, by learning the language, you're able to, to connect to something deeper. And there's something that um, a philosopher called Sophie Oluwole, who was a Yoruba um, African philosopher, and she basically said something to the effect of culture isn't just about the dress they wear, what they're doing, or how they're saying something. It's about how they think and understand reality. And I think when you're applying that to language learning, it's really interesting to see the deeper meanings of words. So, for example, ile in Yoruba, which means home, and ile in Yoruba, which, also, which means earth, they literally are spelt identical, I-L-E, but obviously they, because of the um, accents, they are pronounced different. And I think that's a, a great example in showing that the word, which may look the same, they're sort of tied together to have a deeper meaning, that home is earth. And, and that appreciation of, of, of connection to earth and, and respect for, for surroundings. And you can get that in the process of, of learning Yoruba language. So yeah, my advice would be for, to be open and curious to, to dig deeper into the meanings of words and seeing how interconnected uh, certain words are and what the, the deeper meaning of those words are trying to convey. Mm-hmm. message behind them. I like that. I think that, you know, we have, um, I guess like in some languages there are like root words that will give you an indication of kind of what the language means. Or for example, in English, if you see like R E in front of a word, you know, it's like something that's done again. Um, or pro at the front of a word, something you know is for, um, in, in, in favor of, right? And I think that I love, what I love about Yoruba and the things that I've heard about it before, I really like that it forces you to look at that deeper meaning. It for, like you don't, you don't really have a choice, mm-hmm. you know? And it's, it's, it's good, like it, it forces you to look at this meaning and, and to do, to have some contemplation, um, in a way that I don't think a lot of people bother to contemplate because they just want to get to the level that they need to 
be able to communicate. And a lot of people, I think, don't really spend too much time on the deep dives. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, because it's interesting when I wanted to learn more, <laughs> more Yoruba and get comfortable speaking it, I was approaching it from that point of view, like, okay, yeah, let me just memorize, let, let's get these words in and like start, start speaking and things like that. And you, you're right. It, it reflecting, it just forces me to be like, oh, okay. Like what is the deeper meaning behind this? And okay, this is called that because that links to that idea of seeing things in, in this way. And I think that's such a, it's, it's, it just speaks to the richness of, of language learning. Mm. Um, and an opportunity to, yeah, see things from a different perspective and yeah, not just through, through languages, but through, like through the names of people, they're Mm. all telling stories and it's going back to that storytelling ability that is embedded in, within a language. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How is your, how are your studies going? With yeah, it's, your, going. With Yoruba. <laughs> <laughs> it's going it's going well um lockdown has affected <laughs> my my attendance somewhat but um yeah it's going well I'm I'm really appreciating learning through music and my teacher is is big on music and and that's really helps me to um yeah that's a not just memorize I, in the sense that okay it's in my brain but really sort of um feel a connection to, to the words that I'm learning. Mm-hmm. Mm. Do you have any musical favorites? <laughs> Are you asking me to sing? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, if you're, if you're listening to music, are there any artists you like or any songs that you like? Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have been listening or not just from my, from my teacher, but yeah, I would suggest um, Adekunle Gold. He is a Nigerian artist. He's um, been out for a while, but listening to his music um, has helped. Um, Beautiful Nubia is another artist from Nigeria. And the way he um, tells stories is is so beautiful, um, how he uses uh, instruments to convey the importance of values and the importance of of going deeper uh, into into self and into understanding your surroundings so those are two artists that I really enjoy to to listen to yeah do you have any are there any uh writers that you enjoy um that people may be able to people listening to this episode may be able to um you know read their works any uh, authors, poets, or mm. I would say Sophie Oluwole. Um, she's a brilliant writer, and I find her work to be very, very. She goes deep into subjects, but she says it in a very clear way, and it's it's just really amazing to get an insight to to Yoruba proverbs and and um, if you're interested in learning more about the origins of Ifa and, and things like that. It's a really, really good reference point. Mm-hmm. Um, I would also recommend, this is an autobiography. So it's a book about Fumilayo Ransom Kuti. And she was the mother of uh, the musician Fela Kuti. And she literally, it's, it's an amazing book because you get an insight to the not just a person's life, but the presence of women in, in Yoruba society and the amazing role historically of, of women in, in Yoruba society. Um, so yeah, those are some books that I'd recommend. So I want to know about Oro Anike and your book, Connecting to Self Through Ancestry. Um, we talked a little bit about it before, but what made you decide to start this education hub and to write your collection of essays? Um, tell us everything. What's the aim of your platform and tell us where you plan to go in the future. Hmm. So yeah, Ora Anike came about because 
I was really curious to learn more about um, Afri- just African history and to create a space where it wasn't just talking about dates where like this happened in 1850 and this happened in 17, whatever. I really wanted to get a, a sense of everyday life and that's, and culture was that reference point for me to, to speak about that. So being able to un- come up with a topic and look at a specific cultural practice and go into the deeper meaning and how we could then relate that to present day. Because I think it's the key aim of the hub is to reflect about the past, but reflect about the lessons that we can take from the past to apply to to our own lives now, because I think it's important to have that link between past and present Mm. uh, continuing. And that's what Oro Anika seeks to do. So whether it's through my writing or the interviews that I have with people, or the videos that I create, I really want to create a space to reflect, broaden, broaden perspective. And yeah, hopefully that is, those are ingredients for a person to grow and expand in, in their life. And so, yeah, that's, that's what Oro Care is, is about. And part of the project resulted in me feeling inspired to create a book connecting to self through ancestry. And that was me wanting to reflect on my heritage. So the book is focusing on 10 elements of Yoruba heritage. And I basically offer some personal reflections as well as looking at general reflections of how heritage and well-being interact with each other and the lessons that can be taken from the engagement with ancestry that can help to better connect to self. So that's the that's what that book is about. And yeah, it's it's really a, an opportunity for me to give thanks to personal lessons as well as my heritage. Tell us where we can find you and where we can find your book. Sure. So you can find me on oranike.com and I'm also on Instagram at oranike. Those are the two spaces online that I'm available. And you can also purchase my book, Connecting to Self Through Ancestry, through my website. Fantastic. That's great. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a copy of your book because I think that what you're doing is really important, um, having these conversations and having these reflections. Um, I think that for all of us throughout the diaspora, um, especially after this year of 2020 that we've been having is just mm-hmm. like, there's a lot of, I'm going to say the word coming home, mm-hmm. but I don't think it's really, I don't know if that's an apt term for it. I think there's a lot of re-understanding of who we are. And I think that a lot of us, I, maybe I'm only speaking for myself and I'm projecting, but I think a lot of us want to feel like there's something to come home to. Mm -hmm. I think we want to feel like what those connections are, but I don't think that a lot of us know how, and I don't think a lot of us know where to start because I think this, there has to be a lot of correction of what we've always learned and what we've always known in quotes in quotes known to be true Mm. um and that's what i think is you know i'll I'll say it again i think that's what's important about your platform is that you know you are exploring that and i hope that people who are looking to make those connections and understand those connections for themselves i hope that they can look at your site and read your book and find their own pathways um, mm. back home, <laughs> back to um, to our our authentic selves as as Black people, as African descendants in the diaspora. Um, I personally, um, I'm so happy to have had this conversation with you, and I I 
I'll say it again, you know, I was really drawn to your work as um, someone living in the diaspora because I, I am personally drawn to to that, like um, African descendants all over the world. And I'm, I'm always curious of how we're moving through the world and mm. how we have communities. Um, you know, growing up here in the U.S., I honestly, I remember not even realizing that there were Black people who lived in places like England or France or uh, Germany or Ireland or or Brazil, for example. Um, and granted, that was a long time ago before the before the internet, so <laughs> I didn't know. But um, I'm really aware of how different we all are, but how we all. Trauma is too strong of a word, but I guess we all share a collective trauma in, in the past through, um, through slavery, through, through being treated as property. Mm. Um, and I, I'm glad that in, in this year, in this year specifically, but I'm glad that going forward, um, so many of us hopefully can connect and begin to heal one another and learn from one another and and share our experiences. Yeah. I definitely also think that in spite of it all, there's hope and we see those reflections that yes, there might be there, you know, collective trauma of sorts, but there's also collective resilience of sorts to like immense scales, immense scales. It it's it always just inspires me to see when I, the example that I gave of Jamaica or in other spaces where I see imprints of African heritage still going, that is speaking the language of resilience that in spite of dehumanizing immoral things occurring, humanity exists. And those, those pockets of, of, culture which is telling that is speaking that language of remembrance i think it's really really powerful for people in the diaspora absolutely well i know that is a very big topic but i like to end on a light note (laughs) (laughs) this is a strange transition but um i like to ask do you have any jokes popular sayings tongue twisters slang words, idioms, words of wisdom or advice in Yoruba to share. Or I'm going to open this up. It could be Spanish too, or Portuguese, or British English. (laughs) Anything you'd like to share. (laughs) I will share, um, this is actually, I guess this would be considered Pidgin English. um, And Pidgin English is basically an amalgamation of uh, like Yoruba with some, with, yeah, with English. Um, so this is a saying that I used, my mom always said like growing up and it's, it stayed with me and it's basically, he get as it be. And this is a song title from a musician called Orlando Owa. And this speaks to me in so many ways. It's, it's basically encompasses this Yoruba word uh, called itelon, and that is contentment. And it get as it be basically means it is what it is. And it's that sense of like, no matter what happens, I, internally I'm fine. And as long as that's, you know, that's, that's there, we can see, we can go through anything that life, you know, offers us. Mm-hmm. So it get as it be. Can I try it? Yeah. Say it one more time and I'll try and then you tell me if I and get I'll, as it be. It get as it be? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. It's a, so yeah, every time like my mom said that, it was when she was like, okay, basically saying, I'm surrendering to this. It get as it be. <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. So Anike, thank you so much for joining me and 
having this conversation about language and sharing bits of your culture with me and with everyone listening. Thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. I'm a big fan of the podcast. So this is a nice experience to be yeah, here. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm so happy that you are that you are listening to the show and that you enjoy it. Um, really quickly, without thinking too hard, in this context, what would be the best way to say goodbye? Ooh. Um, Odi, Odaro, until morning. <laughs> I don't Od- know why that came to me. Odaro, Odaro. 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 Mm-hmm. Perfect. Well, Odaro. Thank you so much again, and I will be talking to you soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.